Hi, this is Dr. Kevin Kirby. Uh, in this lecture, we're going to be discussing the concepts of root theory versus tissue stress theory. And the main thing we're going to be discussing today is my experiences during my biomechanics fellowship, uh, going from being a staunch root theory advocate to uh, developing this idea of subtelogen axis location and especially uh, rotational equilibrium. So in the last two videos, I discussed uh, subtelogen action location, how I discovered that, and then in the second video, we discussed uh, the problems with root theory. So <clears throat> going back to July 1st, 1984, when I started my biomechanics fellowship at CCPM, I uh, was starting to find early on that the root measurements that I'd been taking uh, were not comparing well or were able to be predictive of the patient's gait or the patient's pathology. And we have already reviewed that. In addition, I had already experienced as a student uh, the inaccuracies of the root method with the heel bisection being the <coughs> chief way that we um, evaluated people uh, in addition to determining their forefoot deformities, rear foot deformities, whether they had an Aquinas and that sort of uh, concept. Uh, at the time, I had a number of things also going on. Uh, luckily, number one, I was, as a student, I had uh, had the experience of working with uh, Dr. Richard Blake, who was my biomechanics fellow when I was a uh, third year student. And we had a group of uh, avid runners in our uh, class, the class of 1983, uh, the California College of Podiatric Medicine. And many of us were very interested in learning how to make orthotics. So, at the time, uh, Dr. Blake was working on his Blake inverted orthosis technique, and we were his lab rats, so to speak. Uh, we would volunteer to help make orthotics for him just to get the experience of making orthotics from the plastimo with the Blake inverted orthotic technique. So what I saw by watching patients walk, not only in my student years, but also uh, during my residency years, walking and running in Blake orthotics, that this inverted heel orthotic produced a, uh, uh, a large effect in reducing the amount of pronation of the foot. Um, Rich, had, uh, Rich Blake had um, advocated this and experimented with this extensively, but he didn't get a lot of support from the um, uh, professors at CCPM, many of them who thought that he was going down the wrong track to make a non-root orthotic. Um, so that was a good experience for me, seeing that this totally different type of orthotic with an inverted heel and a plantar fascial accommodation the flat rear post, flat rear foot post actually was very efficient. The prevailing thought at the time, as I mentioned before, was that heel verticality was the key to having a normal foot. And as I said, mentioned in the second lecture, we in the first lecture, we did discuss about how the uh, plantar aspect of the heel uh, was thought to produce some sort of stability, even though this wasn't said. The drawings in Root's book, textbook, and um, Scarlato's Combinium uh, tended to indicate that. And this was emphasized, if it wasn't a heel vertical position, it couldn't be a normally functioning foot. There really was very little discussion in our training on the forces acting across the subtalar joint. So this was, um, we discussed structure. We discussed is a heel vertical, uh, what is a forefoot to rear foot, and then the ground was assumed to put forces across the bottom of the foot. But we really didn't talk about if the forces were medial to the axis or lateral to the axis. This was not a discussion, and so this was something that I really hadn't considered because I hadn't been uh, taught that much. Also at the time, as I mentioned in the first lecture, John Weed had shown me his technique where he was pushing medial, uh, pushing on the plantar heel to see if he had to push really far medial, then he'd have to use, uh, to get the foot to supinate, he'd have to use uh, orthotic techniques that would be anti-pronation, such as a deeper heel cup, stiff orthotic plate, and a flat uh, extended river post. The, um, when I started doing this subtotage on palpation, I was very impressed with how, uh, number one, I could find the subtotage on axis. It seemed to be consistent going for the posterior lateral heel. So when I did this uh, subtotage on axis palpation, when I pushed on the um, 
on the lateral to the heel underneath the axis, it wouldn't move. If I push medial to the axis here, I would get a supination effect. And then if I push lateral to the axis over here, I would get a pronation effect or pronation moment. And by mapping out these points of no rotation along with what I could get the plantar representation of subtelgian axis. And in seeing this in the people I was examining, I started to see that the calcaneus was at the receiving end of the supination moments because uh, from my radiographic study I did with Alan Lohendorf and Rene Cucorio, we were seeing that the medial tubercle of the calcaneus was actually rounded and not didn't have two little knobs resting on the ground, but the large medial tubercle was rounded so that the calcaneus could easily rotate in, 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 in and in eversion, but that the medial tubercle was well medial to the axis. So I got this idea that this was uh, something we saw in all the normal feet. As the subtelgian axis, we started noticing in the more pronated feet, the feet that had more pronationary symptoms, we started to see the subtelgian axis going more medial. And if we had feet that were more uh, had more supination symptoms, such as perineal tendinopathy or uh, chronic ankle sprainers, the subtelgian axis became more laterally located. The um, and at the time, I was doing a lot of thinking, a lot of reading. As I mentioned before, I was reading um, the works of Hicks. I did a lot of reading of the running biomechanics literature, and Ben O'Nig's literature was very important at the time because he actually mentioned uh, the subtelgian axis and how hitting the ground and heel striking at the time of impact in, uh, in a heel striking runner, if it hit lateral to the axis, it would produce a pronation moment. And so uh, reading the Brian biomechanics literature versus reading the podiatric literature, they really didn't talk a lot about uh, torques or moments. Uh, the running biomechanics literature in the mid 80s was going this direction. And this is something I grabbed onto and said, wow, this is something that I think we need to have in podiatry. So during that time also, I spent uh, one day a week at the uh, Kaiser Hospital in Vallejo, and I worked as the clinician all day long, making orthotics, dispensing orthotics, and adjusting orthotics for the patients, uh, ranging from children ages three and above to adults with many different problems. And I was the only biomechanics clinician there, so I was uh, supposed to act independently and not have professors there to help me. And this was a great benefit for me because I could see if my um, uh, theories uh, and measurements doing the root theory uh, using the root theory match better or was the subtelgian axis location a better match and I was starting to really do a lot of thinking at the time but it was still had so many different uh, I didn't have anyone to bounce any ideas off with with because no one else was thinking in this way and so the combination of the seeing the subtelgian axis location with palpation method the radiographic technique, the anterior axial x-ray, which I invented, that allows us to look at the plantar aspect of the heel, see all that was routed. Seeing the experience of having the Blake inverted orthotic showing increased, prona increased supination control, uh, pronation control of the foot uh, by having a more inverted heel. I was uh, actually had a, I guess you would call it an epiphany. I was driving home in late 1984 from Kaiser Vallejo to my home in San Francisco, which was about a 45 minute drive. And I was thinking about this axis location and how it could be significant. And, and I had this thought, wow, this is really something. What if the stability of the foot is not produced by a vertical heel, but rather a balance of moments, or later on, I would call it rotational equilibrium, that the forces, ground reaction forces acting at the plantar heel, counterbalance, which are a supination effect, so the, the supination moments being produced by the ground reaction force underneath the plantar heel, which is medial to the axis, is being balanced exactly by the pronation moments acting underneath the lateral uh, forefoot. And I knew the heel stability was thought to be due to vertical calcaneus, and I thought, uh, just from thinking of this, during this drive from Vallejo to San Francisco, 
about a halfway into the drive, I came up with the idea that this is what I've been looking for. This is the stability factor that holds a calcaneus vertical or inverted or everted. It's the balance of moments or balance of rotational forces. And what this allowed me to do was to see that if we press, if we had ground reaction force acting on the heel, that would produce a rear foot supination moment. If we had ground reaction force underneath the lateral forefoot, that would produce a pronation moment. And the subtalar joint wouldn't stop rotating in pronation or supination until we had this exact equaling or counterbalancing of these pronation and supination forces to produce rotational equilibrium. The um, other thing I realized during that drive from Vallejo to San Francisco was this would explain also why as the axis became more medial that we had a higher balance of pronation moments, higher magnitude of pronation moments, less supination moment, which would tend to produce more pronation related symptoms. So here we have a picture of a normal axis location with the, the posterior the axis going out through the posterior lateral calcaneus to the first intermetarsal space so that we have this ground reaction force vector acting on the medial tubercle but if the axis is a medial axis and now the axis is more medial than it was in the uh, other axis in the normal axis foot here we would see that we have more pronation moments than we'd have supination moments and then for lateral axis the exact opposite lateral axis produces more supination moments from ground reaction force and less pronation moments acting on the forefoot. So this thought process I had during this one drive explained multiple things including the balance of moments causing more pronation or supination moments depending on where the axis is, whether it's more medial or lateral. Uh, we also explained how a orthotic such as a Blake inverted orthotic was working by producing more varus wedging effects. So we produce more ground reaction force, more medial on the heel. And this is what Rich was doing with his Blake inverter orthotic. He was inverting the heel a high degree, which put more force medial and produced more supination effect on the foot. And so this allowed me for the remaining six or seven months in my biomechanics fellowship to start working on this theory of subtelligent axis location and rotational equilibrium and these combinations uh, allowed me to uh, continue to try to work on a theory that would um, explain the observations, clinical observations we had with orthotics and with foot function that I thought was far superior to the root theories that uh, I had been teaching and I had been taught and I had been teaching up to the time and at that moment I switched all of my teaching to the uh, concept of the subtelligent axis location and rotation of equilibrium to explain how orthotics worked and how the foot functioned. So uh, just to review, the big change was going from understanding that it wasn't just heel verticality that was causing stability, but rather the balance of moments across the subtelar joint during weight bearing activities that produce the stability of the subtelar joint either in a pronated position or neutral position or supinated position and that uh, later on we would need to uh, work on the idea of uh, rotation of equilibrium to explain the maximally pronated position, which I'll explain in the next video. Thank you.